I'm a very competitive person, logically and rationally competitive. I fucking hate to lose. Nothing drives me crazier than losing. And we have a winner's mentality and we know that there's a lot of companies out there that are trying to solve this problem. A lot of capital that's being deployed these behind these companies. And so we gotta wake up, we need to know exactly what we're gonna build. We need to be on point. We need to communicate, hold each other accountable and just fucking make some moves. Michael True, co-founder and CEO of Prescient AI, is leading a transformative startup that is redefining data science and marketing analytics. His journey from a corporate tech role at IBM to heading a rapidly expanding company is both compelling and insightful, showcasing his relentless drive for innovation and success. In this episode, we look into the captivating story behind Prescient AI's inception and development. Michael shares how he navigated the numerous challenges of early stage startups while balancing personal well-being with professional responsibilities. Welcome back to Turning Pro, Season 2, Episode 4. Today we have Michael True, who's the co-founder and CEO of Prescient AI. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Good to see you guys. Want to jump right into it? Yeah, let's do it. Hit it first. You want to just give us a quick background on yourself and what you're working on? Yeah. Uh, So, personal side, born and raised in Portland, Maine, youngest of seven, lived all over the country doing various jobs, but um, most of the time was... IBM, Oracle, did a quick stint at App Annie. I've just been in the analytics and AI space, running around for the last 11 years or so. So. And walk us through Prescient. What does it do? Who is it helping? Yeah, we work with e-commerce brands, so Shopify, Salesforce, Amazon, and just about to launch a retail model. Um, I was actually doing a pod with the guy, um, what was his name? Raba from Triple Whale yeah. that last week. And he was like, him and John Snow. And we said, uh, we found the one-liner. It's Prescient. Well, Prescient will tell you what happened yesterday. And based off of yesterday, what should happen tomorrow? And then what could happen tomorrow based off of our recommendation systems on how they should reallocate their marketing mixes. Oh, yeah. And you're not just working with tiny brands. You guys are working with some crazy logos. It's been, it's funny when we first launched, like launched the platform, we've been researching the model for three years before that, but we launched the platform. I didn't know anybody in e-commerce at all. So I'm like chasing down anybody who I could get on the platform, free trial, 500 bucks a month, like whatever you need. You guys get the game. You always need to land and expand. Um, and then, uh, progressively, just as you started getting bigger logos, I feel like other brands start to be curious about, well, why is Hexclad using Prescient as their source of truth for their MMM, right? And, uh, yeah, it's been just growing really fast with some of the larger brands. So you went from the, you went, you got as corporate as it, as it can get. (laughs) There's somebody said the other day, we're, but we're redoing the website now and, uh, I've had at least three people tell me, it was like, tell me you worked at IBM without working at IBM. <laughs> so good. <laughs> my uh, my co-founder was at EY for a couple of years. So and I gave up my EY job 12 hours before my first day. Stop it. Yeah. 12, Wait, you were about to start? And you, you 12 hours before my first day. I was supposed to do M&A consulting at EY Parthenon. And I emailed them 12 hours before my first day and said, I'm not going to be there. And the only communication that I had was a return label to send them back the laptop that, that they sent it. me. That was it. <laughs> that was like that confirmed everything I thought about this. A hundred percent. So what, what were you thinking? Like, was were you going to start? Did you do you did you not take the job to just go to the entrepreneurial startup? Yeah, right? but it was. I mean, there's. I guess there's a little bit of nuance in that. I played hockey in college and then graduated in 2020. Right. Uh, which my world was flipped upside down because we were my senior year. uh, We beat Brown in overtime and was still playing hockey. And then two days later, the AD came in the locker room and said, your season's over because of COVID. And so I was actually potentially going to play professionally. COVID just kind of flipped that upside down. And then EY actually gave all the incoming analysts a year to defer the job because they didn't know what was going to happen to their own business. So I took that year option and I joined an early stage COVID testing startup that scaled to 50 million in revenue in five months, which was like a crazy experience. Yeah. And then uh, when I, after I left there, I had three weeks between then and when I was planning to go to EY and I was out in LA visiting my two sisters and I got put in touch with a, a friend who, a mentor of mine put me in touch with another mentee of his, like you guys should meet. I was out in LA, we were talking, having breakfast and he's like, what do you do? And I was explaining, he's like, do you have any interest in coming and doing BD at GoPuff? And I was like, Kind of. And in my mind, when I was still in college, I always thought that you had to go do two years of consulting or banking to then do BD at a high growth tech startup. So when this opportunity presented itself, I'm like, why would I go one step back to go two steps forward? So I told him, I was like, I'm interested, but my job starts like in a week and a half. So I did like seven interviews in nine days and (laughs) they offered me like two days before my first day. I countered and then agreed 24 hours before and then 12 hours before told EY that I wasn't coming. And then you started. So I went to GoPuff, uh, spent a year there and then left and started Platter. 
And when you were at GoPuff, were you doing who, BD? Like, who was your target? I was doing partnerships, but what I was doing for the last eight months was building out an e-commerce business unit called Powered By, which was essentially unlocking instant delivery for e-com websites. Right. Okay. So the idea was like, if you went to liquiddeath.com to buy a case of water right. and the SKU in the basket was in the fulfillment center that was geofenced within your delivery address, right. GoPuff would be surfaced as your fulfillment option. Sure. So I spent all that time talking to Shopify brands, people in the e-com world, and that's how I kind of got into this space. Oh, wow. Saw a lot wrong with how it was operating at least from my perspective yeah. and ultimately just took like a set of pain points that I saw and synthesized that into what is now platter. It's funny how those things come together. Yeah, everything happens for a reason, but that it. was all to say you made a big transition from the corporate world into the startup world. What was the, what was the reason for that? Um, a lot of, I think the last year at IBM we did, we did 334 flights in three years and it was just a very depressing way to spend the end of your twenties. You know, it's like, I was living in San Francisco. Your friends just stopped calling you. Like it's hard to date. You could do anything. You're just living on a plane. And um, I went to New Zealand and Australia for three months and just like kicked it in a camper van. And uh, I was at a, the Blues Festival in Byron Bay. And I'm like, I'm gonna just build the tech platform and sell to a record label with a clean cap table. And uh, so I talked to like the CAA, the head of the data science over there, the creative artist agencies. And I was like what's a problem that I could solve? And they're like, well, we have these mid-tier artists that are going to tour, and we know that there's little pockets of cities that they could stop in and, and make some money and get new fans. So um, we built a little heat map that like scraped everything from like YouTube comments or like, come to my city, right? You could find a lot about like uh, fan bases. And so we created a heat map that just ranked cities and then pulled in some bands and town data for like venues. And the goal was to be able to like predict the most profitable tours, um, who should open up for them in the, like, uh, like a, a SoundCloud rapper is like local in the area, has got like a good fan base, that should be opening up for you, right? Um, and then COVID hit and uh, touring went away. But the big move was just like, I was burnt out, man. I did this for a long time and sold, you know, we did a five year, $750 million contract with Anthem, Blue Cross, Blue Shield. It was, kind of like the last check the box and I was like, all right, I want to try to go do something different. And this was what, two, three years ago? I quit, this was in 2000 and, I quit, wow, dude, it's, yeah, it's 2019. I incorporated in 2018 and I quit my, finally quit my job in 2019. Wow. And. So funny, he's like, I was burned out so I tried to go do something harder. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> well, I was like, dude, I was selling like all these huge deals and I know I could talk to a data scientist about machine learning, but like, very well right and i'm like all right well why can't i just go sell something that's my own and you know yep. have it be on a cap table versus like waiting for a commission payment essentially yeah and um that was kind of the journey man we were talking about this in the conversation uh with eli before this about the idea of burnout yeah and i think it's so funny because when i was like working for someone else and i'd go a little too past eight to six yeah. i was like i'm burning out i gotta <laughs> take a week off and for the past three and a half years, I've been pulling like 12 hour days and I've never felt burnt out once. Dude, you're, you are a beast on like follow up slack availability. Like Thanks. it's, it's not, not just saying it to say it, like I'm a very happy, loyal customer and sending it, you know, people leads over there. It's like, shout out like, verbatim, shout out to verbatim. Like some serious, I was really nervous while taking the jump into like at IBM, nobody gives a shit when you're just, sorry, sorry. Nobody gives you a, can swear. It's, nobody it's gives okay. A shit. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. I'm 36. I want to swear. Okay, I, I won't make, tell your board. I, I was making, <laughs> Shout out to Taylor and Bruce and Cody. Um, but they go, uh, oh, it's too. So it's like, nobody gives a shit about a DB2 database at IBM on LinkedIn. Nobody wants to talk about that. Nobody wants to see that. Nobody wants to see me on Twitter. And I hadn't had exposure to like putting myself out there. And so when these guys were like, yeah, we're going to start blowing up your LinkedIn, I had like this huge pit in the bottom of my stomach. Like, it felt awkward, right? Like, putting yourself out there is on a, such a consistent basis, I was thinking like maybe every other, every other week we'd toss someone out. Like these guys get shit going out like every other day, um, but it's working, right? And like you guys have just done a, it kind of dovetailed your original statement of burning out, but like I had to say like, you guys are not burning out and it's great to see and like the results are great. It's Thanks awesome. man. It's fire. I want to talk about pace and velocity for a second yeah. because before I'd met you, even heard about Prescient, I met up with Will yeah. Uh, when he was still at his last job and we got some souvla in San Francisco. <laughs> so I love that. And he was like, you guys should know about Prescient. Yeah. And I was like, what's the MO? He told me what you guys do. And I was like, no, but what's different? He, and he was like, they just move fast. Yeah. And then when I, uh, Taylor and I were grabbing coffee in Williamsburg. Yeah. And I was, and she was like, we just did this deal. And I was like, how are they different? How are they good? And she's like, they move crazy fast. And they're no <laughs> bullshit about it. And I was like, all right. And then I talked to you and I was like, I get it. Yeah. And so tell me about the importance of, because it, it, it's, 
it's not an easy thing to show up to every call, every interaction, every day and like push that velocity. And so how do you think a lot? That? I think a lot of it comes down to culture. It really does. We, we've hired some, we've been fortunate enough to hire some fucking br mind numbingly brilliant people on the engineering and product and machine learning and research science side. Um, and they come from places where I feel that there's not a level of appreciation for what they're doing. A lot of them come from, you know, a lot of people from Grubhub and Bloomberg and some of the, you know, Facebook or Meta. Um, and we've just, my co-founder said to me early on, he's like, dude, we're gonna have a culture and it aligns with both of us is happy people build great products. And Tony, or shout out to Tony, our director of engineering, was at a baseball game with his son yesterday at 11 in the morning on Slack, sending pictures of the game. People are ch loving it, send us more photos. Tony's submitting their fucking midnight Jira tickets, like pumping things through, right? And so um, there's that element, but I also feel like I'm a very competitive person, I'm logically and rationally competitive. I fucking hate to lose. Nothing drives me crazier than losing. And we have a winner's mentality, and we know that there's a lot of companies out there that are trying to solve this problem, a lot of capital that's being deployed these behind these companies. And so we gotta wake up, we need to know exactly what we're gonna build, we need to be on point, we need to communicate, hold each other accountable, and just fucking make some moves. I love that. You'll you'll appreciate this. It's an offhanded comment, but uh, a friend of mine, I was talking to his dad, very successful entrepreneur, and he was telling me a story about hiring someone, and he looked at a younger, can like younger kid across the room early in his career, and he's like, why should I hire you? And the kid looked at him and said, if you put me in a room with all the other candidates and turn the lights off and put a tennis ball at the center of the table, I'll come out with that ball 10 out of 10 times. <laughs> Wait. That's fucking I was like, that is the coolest <laughs> fucking thing I've ever heard. Where is this guy? Right? <laughs> Let me find you. That's and I, like, so I can, I mean, I can empathize with that because I was, you know, an athlete sure. in my last life and it basically, when hockey stopped, it's like, well, how do, where do I put all that energy and competitive nature? And it went yeah. into, like, business building. So I feel very similar, uh -huh. similarly the, to you in the sense that, like, I just like to win. Yeah. There's, no, there's just no, you're going to lose and you need to know, just, like, when you lose, I'm, why I want to know every every detail about why we lost and like why we're never going to lose that way again. Okay. Yeah, and it's also the thing that you said that I love because we try to do the same thing is like you build a culture around output, not around like clock in, clock out, and time and like Correct. people faking that they're working at a certain hour just to like prove to you that they're doing it. It's yeah. like if you want to go hang out at 11 a.m. on a Tuesday, that go means, for it. Yeah. As long as your job is done at the end of the day and whatever you're responsible for gets yeah. uh, responsible for gets executed, like I don't need to micromanage or watch that. And I do believe when you let people perform in their best self, you get the best output as a business. Agreed. I think there's also different types of competitive drives. Like everyone has their own style of it. And something I did appreciate about you guys early on is that, I don't know if this is radical candor exactly, yeah. but you can bring pace and you can bring competitiveness, but it needs to stay above the line. Yeah. Very direct communication, sure. no holds barred. Yeah versus I've worked with a lot of people in the past. And I'm sure we've met a lot of people that are very competitive and want to win, yeah. but then it can dip below the line. Yep. And then it's like you, you pointing fingers, what happened here? And yep. so how did you, cause I'm sure your style of competition has also evolved over the years. It, it's, we're, we're, it's, it's interesting. Like the, the competitors are now starting to come at us, right? And that's a good thing, right? People are, when people are talking about, it, you know that you're doing something right. And um, there's, it's funny where you're a bunch of nerds battling over competitiveness of, of math. <laughs> right. it's, it's, it's the math Olympics. It's the, only, <laughs> the only thing that matters if like, you know, shout out to the MTA providers in the North Beam Triple Whales rocker boxes of the world out there. They've built a really great pixel and platform to do multi-touch attribution. But when you go into a media mix model and probabilistic optimizations and forecasting, the only thing that matters is the math, right? Not, you can have the ugliest dashboard and the best math because when you tell somebody, hey, you should go do this and it's, this is probably gonna happen, Right. So it's an interesting battle of like, it's not over pricing. It's not over like UI, X, UI, UI, UX. It's, hey, how granular can you go on measurement? How accurately can you back test and forecast? Right. How quickly can your models be when you rerun the model, or refresh the insights? Um, how what is the onboarding experience like? And people are saying to us now, like, hey, they, the, the typical model training time of like the MMMs that exist in the ecosystem can take weeks, right? And our training time, I think we're, Cody's gonna get this under, depending on the size of the company, but anywhere from like 12 to four hours. Like it's unheard of for, and doing it at the campaign level is just unheard of. So people are saying, um, and I, listen, I respect it. Like you gotta come out and find, find a spot you can poke and poke it, but um, how can they have reliable artificial intelligence models if they're only taking hours to train, right? 
And it's better math, right? We use four models that break apart all of the data into tens of millions of little models that all talk to each other and they learn and they train versus taking a huge data set and running it through one big model and taking that time for that model to train. And so um, I thought it was a good aside of like, from a competitive perspective, we like to go at people the exact inverse. Well, it takes them a long time. The onboarding is extensive. Their math of their saturation plots is wrong. You shouldn't be using linear regressions. You should be nonlinear regressions, and here's why. And so, you know, it's been fun fighting it out on the nerds on the nerd front. Yeah, tell us through the uh, walk us through the process of raising capital. That was a very interesting process for sure because I'd never done it before. And like, dude, I grew up in Portland, Maine. Like, there was no VCs in my backyard. There was no tech in my backyard. Like, I had no idea about any of that stuff growing up. I love so, it there, by the way. I went for the first did time. Did you really? Like, three you, weeks went ago. you went to Portland? Yeah, with my college oh, roommates. Yeah, dude, yeah, yeah. stop it. Did you, it was go, a, did you well, go to one of my one of my roommates is from Maine originally. Yeah. So four roommates and all of our significant others, the eight of us went and rented a house on the water for like three days, and it was amazing. Did you guys go to downtown Portland? Yeah, of course. Oh, the old port. Dude, the restaurants and bar scene down there. Awesome. It was bringing back memories. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Early twenties. I was, I was kind of a <laughs> not to not to deter you. I just like I feel like when you meet someone who's like, oh, I was from Portland, Maine. I don't know that many people from there. I'm like I gotta slide that in. Dude, let them know. It never happens. It makes. I'm so proud of actually be, <laughs> being from Maine. Like I'm so happy you just said that. We dude. made lobsters. Like we we made we got live lobsters and we cooked them oh, yeah. and it was the coolest experience. Yeah, yeah. And it was fantastic. Did, did you steam them in a, in a yeah? You steamed them all with time. ocean water. Yes. You got to use ocean water and not regular yeah. tap water. I learned all about it. 100. percent Wow, dude, he did it right too. Um, yeah, I'm heading back there on, on Sunday morning for Father's Day. Um, so raising capital, yeah. So I'm like, how the hell do you do? I didn't know what a safe was. I didn't know what a convertible note was. And um, I went and had this idea, and I got told no 112 times before I got my first $25 angel check. Right? Is that actually the number, 112? I documented every one. Yeah, yeah. And they're still in my investor email update. It counts petty as well. Oh, fun, you got to do it. No, no, you got to no, keep it there. Do. 100 You should send them it. more frequent updates. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, all the the updates are coming through the work they're doing on my LinkedIn, right? People are like, oh, VC, we're getting hit up by a bunch of like top tier VCs as well. Really? Um, yeah. Anyways, I love what you guys are doing. Tell them if you there. if they want a conversation, they have to send you leads. Just, that's I'm not taking any more conversation unless it's like a yeah, it's, good. it's a very good point. There. A check comes with 25 <laughs> brands. <laughs> Let's see how many brands you can get in front of us. Come on, yeah, put it to the test. Um, change the perception of venture capital value to founders. Um, just kidding. I love Taylor, Bruce, and all the. All, we, we got lucky with our investors. They're incredibly helpful. Um, raising capital was was hard, dude. Um, again, we got before. So that touring thing shut down. That was kind of the missing piece here. Touring shut down. We're like, I'm like, what do I do? I'm gonna go. What this whole thing that I built is out the window. The global head of publishing from Spotify. So if you're on Spotify, he made sure you got your publishing rights and you got your royalties. Called me. He says, don't shut it down yet. Measurement in music does not exist because Google Analytics for last click that everybody loves, there's no Google Analytics behind Spotify and Apple Music and Pandora. And so when you're going to promote a song, you have Cardi B, the heterogeneity, I mean the randomness, the amount of variety of data associated to an artist could be virality on TikTok things. It's way bigger than just a consumer brand. So the problem is really hard to say, well, what was driving the stream on Spotify or Apple? Was it the paid spend? Was it the viral TikTok dance they're doing? Was it Cardi going on the James Corbin show or performing at Coachella and announcing the awareness of her song coming up? Like all of these things impact that. And so I met my co-founder, Cody, um, and he's the LeBron James of research. We got really, really lucky. <laughs> bar, bar none in the game, there's not one better research science to go solve this thing. I mean, he was at, when I met him, he had just left Grubhub where he was their global head of research science and AI. He was predicting orders by zip code in New York City to properly staff their drivers so the food wouldn't be cold across 700 markets at 92% accurate. Like, what? It's like an Uber Eats problem plus an MMM marketing problem, like all combined into one. Oh, wow. He rewrote their LTV model from scratch. So I'm sitting there, and he's like a bro. He holds a weightlifting record in uh, California. He was a walk on D1 lacrosse player. He's no. like professional League of Legends. Did we do it? We just got matching tats together too. No oh way. <laughs> is that a formula? That's a that crazy is so funny. Like, are, you, are you really AI co-founders if you don't have the match? Come on. Like, wow. <laughs> he, um, I know I'm going off on a tangent here, but like. No, this is what dude, people want to hear. So he was like, so I'm like, dude, can you solve <laughs> Tell me your experience about fundraising. Dude, look at my matching <laughs> tattoo about AI with my co-founder. You got to give the people what they want, man. And so. That was awesome. Right, um, so they go on. Uh, <laughs> that's fucking hilarious. 
So I'm like, can you solve it? And he was like, listen, it just would have been solved if you take a, if we take an existing research paper and just try to write code on it. And that's what a lot of the AI companies do. Now they take an LLM and they put a dashboard on top, but it's not real AI. Before that, it was like a research paper and you'd write code associated to it. Cody's like, I'm writing my own research paper. I'm building something that doesn't exist here today because Warner Music Group has $7 billion and a whole data science team, and I'm sure they've tried all the research papers. I need four months. I was able to get into the C-suite at Warner. We got all the historical streams and spend and variables from Cardi B, Roddy Rich, A Boogie, a whole bunch of artists, and said, could we predict their past songs, blind. So we trained on everything, and then it was funny, it was Cardi B's WAP song, which we'll talk about in the fundraising process, but could we predict WAP based off of all of the learnings before WAP and the spend for WAP, could we predict how many streams? We came in for that one at 93%, that was the lowest, and then from there it was, a Roddy Rich was 98%, A Boogie was like 96%. And then we started running an optimization model that said, hey, if we had that same budget for Cardi B's WAP song and these songs, and, we sp and our model spent it, here's how many more streams this song could have gotten. When you launch a track in music, the goal is to have the, the highest peak because it kind of flattens out from there. And when it goes into their catalog after 18 months, so these things are printing cash. And so the incremental difference between 10 million, so 10 million streams on the first month to 15 million streams compounding over time makes a drastic difference, right? And so February of 2021, she's coming out with this song. It's going up and it's up and it's up and it's up. And we were watching it and it was March. And I remember Cody called me and was like, dude, the model is 97% confident. If, if Atlantic Records is ever going to take a bet on us, it's now. And uh, I got in touch with their, their GM and said, models, they took the spend recommendation. We hit it at 96.3% accurate. That was the conduit to us going to raise capital because the very next month, Apple announced iOS 14.5. And we're like, dude, this model can work. It could optimize submission forms for a healthcare company. It could optimize downloads for an application. It could optimize credit card signups for MasterCard, bookings for Priceline, or it could optimize spend for an e-commerce store, Amazon store, retail store. And that was our first, we went out and we raised $2.3 million on a pre-seed. Because when we were working with Warner, we were taking screenshots and putting it on a Word doc and just sending it over like a, like a fucking summary or synopsis or whatever, right? Um, we were like, we need to build the infrastructure, we need to build the platform, and so, we raised 1.7, and then we're like, oh, shit, this is taking a little bit longer than you think. So we raised another five. Um, and that's when I feel like, and I'm curious to get you guys' like, perspectives on like the kind of go-to-market side from that early phase is like, what your experiences was is, I wanted to go out and try to get a gazillion people on a wait list and, and on a platform to try it, but I was like, I want to go talk to these marketers. I want to explain what I'm doing, and I want the ones that are going to believe in the secret sauce of what we're building, right? And I want them to be on a Slack channel with us. I want them to be giving us feedback and we will build the best fucking infrastructure dashboard and model for you, right? But that is the give to get for you guys to partner with us. And, um, you know, that's, that was phase one of the, of the fundraise. And what was phase two with Headline coming in? Phase two was Blumberg. And oh. that's when we raised four and a half million with Blumberg, uh, which was interesting because we had those, like, I think we got eight design partners and... We hadn't really launched, we hadn't launched publicly to the market yet. And so we, we converted them at a very low price point to just show that traction price point. But the, the uh, venture market tanked. It was, you saw people doing 75X multiples on top line revenue and sat, like absurd things, which I'm sure some of these people are like biting themselves in the ass on down rounds and like layoffs. Like it was a big bet in that time. But so it, it tanked, which is a blessing in disguise for us. But I'm saying, dude, we're making like, 20k ARR <laughs> and we have this great platform and so I went to the we went to the investors were like listen we don't have the capital we proved to Warner Warner licensed it for several several million dollars right uh, that was a proven point and we said bring in statisticians we have the best math that exists to go solve this we'll open it up to you and so they brought in some people from Wharton Capital One they ripped our math apart and they were like it's, it's the real deal like, it's worth the money for them to go execute and go to market. So we raised the four and a half million and we launched last, we kept the team small too. Like we went from like eight to 11 over the last year. We kept it really small. Shout out to the engineers, man. Like, I don't know how you guys do that. It's fucking insane. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> seriously, it's like, how did that be possible? And so we went out and we uh, hit the market and nobody, I was like, dude, we have the best math. Everybody's gonna come running to us. No marketing team. This is like literally our verbatim's our first marketing team. Um, 
and nobody knows who I am. I come from IBM and like big tech. I'm not in the club yet. So I did a road show, but it went slow. We went really slow for the first February to September, or April to September. 200,000 ARR. And then I did a conference circuit and we launched the optimizer that told people what to do. And then it just went bonkers. We went from like 200,000 to a million in ARR in 43 days, which was just an, an incredible experience to see the wind channel and slacks going off. Yep. And it's like, and we're talking like big, you know, like the cozy earths and the hex clads and nudes and, you know, agencies are starting to give us deals. And it was a really exciting time. And then one of our existing investors uh, called me and just, I'm sitting there on my laptop, big thing in my office down in Miami. My buddy walks in on the screen and an email pulls up and it's a ter fucking term sheet for $10 million. <laughs> I had no idea it was coming. Well, it got preempted. And then um, we, I went out and I, we, we didn't shop it really hard, right? I really loved our existing investor there. And we wanted to get the right next investor. But I talked to some of the bigger funds and they're like, dude, I get it. This is crazy growth, but we want to see six more months, right? And I'm like, dude, these engineers are literally going to drown of like suffocation of this. I was like, we need more capital. We need to have them scale and, and get more resources. So um, yeah, we met Taylor from Headline. And I was like, immediately at breakfast, she was like, I've had five brands in the last two weeks to say that you're the most vital part of their tech stack. And I've been in this space forever, right? She's built her own attribution models. She's been waiting to make a bet in this space. And her and I just had such a strong, like, friendship vibe. I could take a ride with her and as like a, as a road trip for five hours and we wouldn't have to like say a word and we wouldn't feel uncomfortable. That's kind of like a litmus test for me of like for feeling sure. comfortable in a relationship wise. And um, yeah, they all came together with Blumberg, our existing cap table and headline. And for us, it was a no brainer to ask Taylor to join the board. While she's still earlier on her career, she's everybody in the back channel is like, this is the next rising star in the space. And she's just been fantastic. I mean, I think from an outsider's perspective, it's interesting how you're like, you came into this industry with no relationships, but like when I was kind of just watching it, cause we had coffee a while ago yeah, through, and through then Jorge, you, uh, yeah, Jorge, and yeah. then you, you like knew all the people, <laughs> right? You're like doing all the things with all the people that have been in this space. I mean, granted, I've only been in this space for less than two years also. So yeah. like similar to you in that sense, you but you've built up a crazy network as well. Yeah, I mean, like, I would say semi good, probably, it but gets like, better every day. Yeah, 100%. But it was like, then I would watch you, and it's like you're with all those figureheads that have been in the space for a decade who know everyone and anyone, and yeah. like, you're their tool of choice in that vertical that's being pushed everywhere. And I was like, damn, this guy, regardless of the fact that he didn't know anyone when he came, he knew who to go to and who to latch onto very quickly to like yeah. put the foot on the gas to get to where you are now. It's like going to high school, showing up at a new high school. It's seriously. <laughs> it's it's like, which lunch table do I, I want to be at? Sit at, dude. I was sitting there at the Send Lane conference. It was like my first big conference I went to with, uh, shout out to Jimmy from Send Lane. We're going to actually sponsor that again. And we, I had my first chance to speak. This actually story is fucking hilarious. We went out there, but I was watching the podcast. And it was like Jason Panzer, the guy from Ridge, the guy from yeah. Simple Mod. And they're having the podcast. And, um, you know, my homie Nick Shackelford was moderating it. And it's like, it seemed as it was like these huge, like larger than life figureheads of like that have built and scaled these like crazy brands. And it's analogous to like the jocks of a high school, if you will. But they've built these brands. They've built great tech stacks. They have such a good perspective on how to be an operator of these brands. And they are just out there, you know, really pushing up really good information. And when your name is attached to that, um, it helped grow that network. Um, but here's a really funny story about this Sendling conference. So. I don't, I don't smoke weed, right? It's just, I get quiet, I get, it's just not my thing, right? I used to when I was in high school, whatever. Um, and so I'd never, and I never spoke to on stage for in the e-commerce, so I'm going on stage with, with Zach from Triple Whale and somebody else, right? And uh, Nick, Nick Shackelford launches this brand called Breeze, right? It's, it's just crushing it. Crushing it, dude. Yeah. And so he, um, he has all these buckets around. I thought it was a CBD drink, so I crushed two. No way. Two, before, dude, oh, God. Before, before you went up to speak? 45 minutes before I went up to speak. Dude, shut the fuck I up. I got to see a video of the dude, speech. I was absolutely lit on that stage, and I'm quiet. I guess I'm, like, whispering. <laughs> oh, my dude. God. So, like, Connor from uh, Hexclad, like, we just were starting to, like, build that relationship with Hexclad, um, he teased me up a softball of a question. 
And I just sat there. I just, I didn't, I didn't process, and I just sat there and I just stared, and I didn't know what to say. This is not a real story. Shackleford's oh looking at me like, bro, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> it was unbearably painful. Wow. Unbearably painful. It was my first time ever like putting my face up. Yeah, but that, I mean, there's no better way than that for the first one because now you're unbothered probably when you go up there because like it can't be worse. It could not. It could not be worse. Yeah, my eyes were all glazed over. And I had my former like head of sales there. He's like, dude, your eyes are so fucked. I'm oh like, oh, great, dude. Like, this is exactly what I need to be hearing. <laughs> Red eyes on camera, just staring at you. <laughs> it's like, a good product. It's so good. It's a great product. Yeah, he, I mean, he, he brought some it. over a few months ago, and we had a yeah. bunch of people over, and I really liked it. It's, oh, a, it's yeah. a good thing. I really nice. yeah. He's a really nice. We've been throwing golf tournaments. Through. I was just going to, that's stuff. what I was going to say to you finish. I'm like, every other week, it's uh, Mike and Nick are playing golf somewhere. <laughs> it's one of those things. It's like, everybody's, there's a lot of dinners and such, and I love going to them. You can really sit down, but I'm like, all right, well, where's the golf right and like my dad and i've been golfing together for 33 years and it's been a near and dear to my heart and it's such a great place for people to come together and like my co-founder is a golfer shoot the shit oh really yeah he just broke 80 for the first time um we're gonna do another one up here in new york so if you guys in want, new york yeah, we're, we're doing course? one we're doing one uh um in the hamptons or above no, the city or something no the um sh i shouldn't know this when i'm going on a podcast to promote these things um <laughs> I just talking about it. I'll get back to you guys. Uh, Wes, Wes, we're doing it with a company called Flex as well. Cool. And their whole team does kind of the back end stuff. But we're going to do one in New York. And we I have probably got a couple brand people for you who would. Yeah, who would, we uh, toss, come toss the logo on too. We'll figure something out too. I'd love yeah, to have yeah. your co founder come out and play. Hell um, yeah. The, uh, but yeah, golf is fun. Do you guys golf? I dabble. dabble. I do want to talk about I, I love the idea of stacking things that you love to do with like people that you want to hang out with. 100%. And nothing like I. I love a good coffee meeting as much as anyone else. Yeah. But when you're able, I mean, you have like a sauna and a cold plunge on your roof. When you're doing it's something, <laughs> when you're doing something hard, we gotta, we're gonna do, else. we're gonna do just, like a, a platter pressing uh, cold plunge sauna hangout next time you're back, dude. Saturday, if you guys do, if you guys jump Saturday, I already sent you the link. Oh, did you really? Yeah. I'm, I'm being a good podcast. No, you're good. You're right? good. Um, Post podcast, we can do like saunas every time. There but you go. It, it is such a special thing when like even if you know someone very lightly, yeah. All of a sudden, you're doing like a hard thing and sweating with them. Sure. It's. Uh, you're immediately best friend. A hundred percent, dude. You guys can relate to like the I, pressure test of I'm the... actually just going to pull it up for you verbatim because I just made a post about, no pun intended, I actually just made a post about this like last week. What about like sweating it out with someone? It was like I went to, I went and did a boxing class with... Uh, oh, nice. I did see Do that you know course. Jay from 10,000? The brand? Yeah, right here. Though, like, it was like, I literally put struggling to build deeper relationships, question mark, do hard things with people when you meet them the first time. Grinding in a workout is a much more memorable first experience than sitting at a bar having three beers. Bar. That's a bar. It's just like you'll you'll remember it more, I think, when you when you go through a little bit of adversity alongside yeah, sure. someone. Especially if you get shit faced at the bar with somebody, you're definitely not gonna remember it. Yeah, and look, I, I stopped drinking like a year and a half ago and I have nothing against people who do it or anything right. about it. I just think that for me it was like, okay, if I'm gonna build a company and I know that part of my job is networking, like yeah. how can I align my interests 100%. simultaneously with the people that I want to be meeting, yep. which is why I started doing things like this. And like podcast is another great example. Like I love talking to people way fucking smarter than me. And you can like, there's a lot of value from it, right? You get like content that you can post. You can yep. actually learn something and personal brand build si at the same time. Yeah. And build like meaningful relationships. And stuff. Yeah. Like, like it's funny. I had never met him in person. Right. And it's like, we chat so often. He's like, you know, he's a guy's guy chilling to shoot the shit and stuff. And like, it's nice to like put faces to names and communicate and sit down and talk. And, you know, we had met a few months ago and like, it's great to come back and hear like, I want to kind of get more of the latest on your side too, but it seems like things are, are ripping and running for platter as well. You guys are hiring and feeling that, that inflection point right now. Yeah, it's real. I feel like this is the first time for real where I'm like, all right, it's actually like happening. Yeah. Uh, it's been fun. I mean, the, the hiring thing has been quite a journey. I will double in team size over the span of like a month or two, which has it. been yeah. a lot. But I think it's cool because when we first started, I told myself that the, our ask to brands is pretty big in the sense that like, I'm asking you to port your entire existing website over to Platter. Yep. And we're working with, we're not working with new brands. Like all our brands are doing, you know, at least a million dollars on their e-com store. Sure. So when you think about going to someone who has an existing infrastructure and trying to get them to switch their store over, yeah. From the outsider's perspective, you're like, that's kind of a big ask. I don't really know how many people are going to be like down for that. Like, sure. I'm already doing 10 million online. Why am I going to rebuild my entire e com store? And then when it started resonating and like top of funnel was not our issue, I was like, oh, this is wild. Nice. I never expected <laughs> this to happen. Yeah. Um, but look, it's like the natural progression of building. You got to course correct. Like, we're getting good traction. So now we have to make sure we can meet the demand of what's happening. 
said like a true entrepreneur right there, dude. You know, it's and verbatim. You've been, dude. The amount of logos you have on your site and the people you've got to get Prussian's new lo new logo on there. You have to get our new. One, I, once it goes live. I know. I can't. I was, that was really hard to say to do a rebrand. To be honest with you, it was like that was that little circle thing. Oh, yeah. you changed the logo. I was like just Cody and I and two guys in a digital garage grinding it out and screen shares and all that shit. Like, and now it's like the website has to go. Everything needs to get updated. But um, yeah, I mean, when we were introduced to you via Taylor, I believe. Yes. Yeah, Taylor. Will or Taylor? Taylor yeah. Will or Taylor? What's your website? I'm like, dude, everybody and their mother on your on your website. But the best part about his website is the simplicity of oh, it. Oh, it is. It's, it's nothing but like one line. Here's what we do, and if you're unsure who we've worked with, just look at these 200 <laughs> logos. He actually he texted me like a week and a half ago, and he's like, dude, you gotta update your website. We used to have like a rotating brag bar yeah. for like logos, yeah. and he's like, no, you need to like stack a couple lines and just put all the logos on there. We just shipped it today. Did you really? Yeah. So instead of instead of having the brag bar, it's just like I don't know. I think we have three lines of like six or eight logos, and it's just like 20, 25 logos all st um, static instead of it like rotating. Yeah, I think it depends on the. I'll technical. trust this. I'll, tr I'll trust the social proof guy on like how you should be doing it. Whatever you do, I'll follow your lead. <laughs> I, I, it does depend on like the technical complexity of your product. Yeah. Because if something is more like we couldn't have a two liner if we didn't run content. Like, totally. There are like prescient like needs a lot more copy. Some on explain, the site. explainability to it, yeah. But I do think for the most part, like once people have seen you around, like you're hustling around the ecosystem, you know the right people now. You're yeah. hosting events, and you're doing go-to-market activities, and people are starting to come in. Once people have heard about you, all they really care about is like who you work with. Yeah. Do they have a good experience? What were the results? Do they like you? 100%. Do they like the team? Yeah. And then after that, as long as they like grok the core product, sure. That's kind of all they care about through the funnel. I, I couldn't agree with you more, dude. It's like, I feel like at the beginning stages, there was, because I've been selling for a long time, I know how to earn trust up front and like have those conversations. And it's, you're the founder of the company. If you're going to take a risk, like you have direct access to, you know, something goes wrong, you can hit me up, right? It's like, as companies scale, like I, I would love to have it always be that way. But the, um, dude, I just lost my train of thought. The, uh, It's the best part of being able to edit a podcast. Can you guys edit that out? We can, but I feel like it's I more authentic like, to keep I, it in I, there. Keep it, yeah. We're, we're all about authenticity. We're all, you're all humans. I got a lot of shit on my mind today, and one of it just popped. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I got things going on for like personal lives. I got Verizon calling me. I'm at this conference. We're meeting with Bed Bath and Beyond this morning. I'm like podcast. I got three suitcases over there ready to go to Europe. But this is, but this is all. This is what it's all about. This is all about. Yeah. So don't. Edit you that. could be sitting at your cubicle at uh, IBM <laughs> still, but like you. <laughs> You're That's like that, not, uh, not like the that same. Biden meme just sitting in your chair. <laughs> did you see the Did you see the one oh that just got posted God. a couple days ago? Was, of him? So was it a, a concert? What was it? Oh, it's, dude, I couldn't it's, watch it's that. The and the meme was like, yes. well, it was like when the mushrooms hit or something. And it's just like him like standing there like this. And I was like, it's like Gosh. our country's an SNL skit. Oh my God. So bad. So bad. <laughs> Everyone's like plapping and pointing it up, doing like everybody's in rhythm, doing the Everyone's same dance. dancing. And, and Kamala's <laughs> next to him dancing. It's frozen. Like, well, one question I have for you is, we talked about like speed and pacing. Yeah. I think for a lot of companies, that can be your differentiator. You just move faster and you yeah. do things faster, Push even it if out. it's a similar product. And so I'm curious for you and like a lot of people that are flying around taking meetings, you came with your luggage because you want to do this and we can build content from it. Pacing is awesome, but when you get tired, how do you still show up with a fast pace? I will take a personal day, block it off. What do you do in that day? I run, mm -hmm. I love to run. Yeah, I'm down like, by 35 pounds, dude, I got, I got really unhealthy like last year during this personal stuff. Like the, just, we're all, we're all fucking humans. Like it happens. Yeah. And, uh, I was burning myself out because when we went and had that hockey stick, dude, that was 16 hour days, six days a week, like, back to back calls oh, yeah. and then trying to get the deals done. Cause I took over, I ended up owning the sales process again after that. And while we were searching for somebody else and so Doing that plus just all of the other day to day stuff of the, it was fun. And then the fundraise hit, and then you needed to maintain these clients, and then you needed. To, it was just a very unique time that I will never take. I'm blessed at the opportunity to go through the experience, but I would be lying to say like it wasn't a ment mentally tolling on your physical health and your mental health. And after that, now that we have kind of a team and where everything's in, people like Will Holtz to come in and just like run the sh get the ship tight. Um, I, you know, now I'm able to still grind it out, but uh, I wish in hindsight that I prioritized that 
in, in balance. Like those deals still would have gotten done. Like I was just so obsessed with like making it happen and moving fast. But you need that. It's so you easy. It's so easy yeah. to say that. And after the fact, like I wish I would have been, yeah. you know, more I healthy. But like I don't know. Every single every single successful founder who's jacked, it's because like they already made it. Like you know, <laughs> you know who I keep giving shit to now is. Do you know Aaron Spivak with yeah. Hush? Oh yeah, Hush. I met him a couple. He's times. like he has like a trainer living in his house now, and he's like he's like for the next ninety days just getting completely jacked. The guy's like cooking all his food and doing all his workouts. I'm like. He he earned the right to do that because he yeah. treated his body like shit for seven years to build yeah. hush, and now he's like, I want to get myself right. Yeah, would he have been able to have as much success as he had had he been like prioritizing all the wellness stuff? Probably yeah. not. Yep. Um. So I think hindsight's you know yeah. it's I don't know I wouldn't I would look at it more as like an experience and you're just kind of falling forward and evolving. For yeah. But I'm, I'm curious like in your current day like what are your non negotiables to make sure that you're prioritizing those things? R so I run. Uh, run like a madman More every day oh dude personal like every i'm so excited to go run the west side highway tonight on the as the sun sets when i used to live here in christopher street in west village that was my i just i have a like top one percent of severity of adhd or add now i prescribed the, i'm prescribed the legal limit that a human is allowed to be prescribed to for adderall and how many um, milligrams is that 60 a day whoa yeah holy <laughs> shit um and It's just, it's really hard. I move fast. My mind is moving fast thinking about a bunch of things, but sometimes it's a, it moves, things get done slow because there's so much like, and if you're, if I'm, if I'm not running, like it's, it's just such a weird relief. Do you wear headphones when you run? Yeah. Sometimes you, I don't listen to music when I run. Though. Okay. I, I was just going to ask if you've ever tried with nothing like yeah, silence. Yeah. I, I will walk 40% of the time you see me have headphones and I'm not listening to anything. I haven't worn headphones to exercise in probably over a year. Really? No music. No just music. thinking. Yeah. The funny part is, is it was my I, therapist that actually was the reason I started doing that because I'm very ADHD as well, and yeah. I realized it was the only time in my life where I could not try to distract myself, even if I tried, and so I'd be able to process on my all my unresolved thoughts while running. So I give that a shot. I have. I it's really uncomfortable this. the first couple of times. I'm just warning you, but yeah. you got to try to push through I mean, it. Fuck, I'll try. And if you, if you get if you get into the flow state of it after the first couple, yeah. I almost I, I realized like I don't even know if I like running or I just like the way it makes me feel mentally. So that's why I'm doing it. For me, it's the latter for sure. Like I don't particularly enjoy like I'm a long torso, short leg sort of guy. Like <laughs> I'm taking a lot of fucking steps to get through that six months. You know what I mean? I'm not gracefully galloping down like Bambi or something like that. But it's the it's just the it's like your body just releases like mm. yeah so that's my non-negotiables for that um non-negotiables is having blocked do not disturb times you know what i mean for how long two hours and is that a morning thing or an evening thing it for depends you? on the like wednesdays wednesdays and thursday there's no there's no do not disturbs pretty mm -hmm. much calendars just let's rock and roll and crush meetings friday is pretty much just blocked for you know like important you know, like trying to close big deals and yeah. things that are going on internally. But yeah, having downtime running. Um, the routine has been hard, man. I think the last 90 days I've been in a hotel, the last 57, the last 90 days. And I'm shutting down. Like after Monday, I'm going home to Maine and then going to Charleston for a month. Shutting down. I'm going to get a trainer. like, <laughs> yep. And I'm, I'm no, no social media outside of what we're doing, the work there. Dude, I'm just gonna send it for a month. No alcohol. Like I'm not a huge drinker. I'll have a couple beers watching the games. You know, blue collar main guys and stuff. You know, watching the Celtics and shit. But like, it's buckle down time. And then, you know, do the same over in Europe with or my investors over there. So he's got a good like kind of startup nomad community. Oh, amazing. And we're just gonna do like a lot of like mental thinking and you know meditations and running. And it's gonna be a summer of health for sure. It's great because it was a it was a I mean you earned three it. years of unhealth three yeah. four, four years of totally just like, yeah. do you guys get it dude it's a fucking grind if pression fails why did that happen oh my god um, well define fail exit um, for five million instead of a billion yeah well then it'd be a down round nobody's getting paid uh, yeah I mean I think I think the outcome where no one gets paid why did that happen um. If something happened to my, like, dude, Cody's the backbone. It's fucked up because I feel the same way about Kieran. Yeah. Feel the it's, same way. Like about someone's like, someone what, what's team? your, <laughs> it's like dependency risk. My technical co-founder. It's like put, put a helmet and elbow pads on that guy when he crosses the street. You ever seen the movie? It's called the imitation game. It's about Great Alan movie. Turing. Oh, dude. Benedict Cumberbatch. Um, it's about this guy, Alan Turing, who built this thing called Enigma. 
uh, or whatever, it was the broke Enigma, he built this machine that was able to decode what the Germans were saying, and he saw, he, he ended World War II, it was one of the biggest drivers of that. Everybody was hating on him, and they were trying to do their own research. Nobody touched that machine for years. It was just him. He knew the ins and outs of it like nobody else. Cody, my co-founder, there's no research paper that exists to what he's built, and nobody until recently has ever touched his, had the code, right? So it, it, reading it looks like a, a Chinese language. Mm. There's hundreds of thousands of lines of code, right, that are in there, and if something ever happened to him, it would be a very long time for somebody to ramp up on that. But how do you think that's it's a, you bring up a really good point though like at what phase in your business if not now do you figure out ways to like reduce that dependency risk just in spirit of like healthy business practices? <laughs> Cody sounds crazy but like we hired we hired a you know shout out to he's been probably two months two three months a guy named Alan brilliant PhD Alan um, Caitlin and then we just recently hired our director of data science uh, uh, Philip who was the global head of engineering for Grubhub on all their data science models. PhD in linguistics from Stanford. He's like, a, so now we're starting to pass over a lot of Cody's knowledge base documentation and getting that foundation loud out. And Cody's now starting to go research our retail model. So any brands out there, Shopify or Salesforce on Amazon and on retail as well. We are now going to be partnering with five to 10 brands that are, um, that will be able to measure the impact of their digital marketing spend of all their marketing spend. And how does that impact your um, your D2C store, your marketplaces, and retail as well? And so um, I was kind of looping that in there. If you know, Cody's now starting to democratize the education on the model and go build the retail model next. What are some of the crazy metrics that you guys have seen? We from like a client base. Yeah. Oh, dude, I love the. He's actually calling me here tonight. I know I talk a lot about Hexclad, but they are they become our family. They're a great brand. They're locked and loaded with us. But um, we just came out with our second case study with Hexclad. Um, but uh, the first one was is uh, they saw, compared to their prior spend period, an 85% uptick of top line revenue growth. Right? And here's how crazy this was, dude. Like our, our saturation plots, right? You spend two, $10 and you make 10. You spend two and you make 10. You can't expect to spend... 2 million to make 10, right? Eventually it's going to saturate. Of course. And so, but Facebook was telling something that was rather misleading, right? About where they're kind of, we, we said that the campaign could either scale up or down. I'm not going to go too much into strategy or whatever, but we were able to identify a, a spend point that our model set is like, here's the right spend point, And then here's how you should reallocate that budget across other campaigns. Like and, don't spend above this number on this campaign and take that. Day. Yeah. And take the rest of the money and reallocate elsewhere. Yeah. And, uh, and, and click a button in 45 seconds, it spits that back out, which theoretically in the past, when they first started, they would run these once a year, quarterly, monthly, maybe some people are doing a week, 45 seconds, campaign level, output, ready to rock and roll. Um, and it was tangible, measurable results. Good American, uh, Ryan Sliper was their former CR chief revenue officer of Good American, Khloe Kardashian's brand, um, who's now an investor and advisor of the company. Um, he... Uh, He's like, dude, I've been doing this for 20 years. He's like, there's no way you're gonna onboard me in 20 minutes and have this models trained in two days. If you go to the Good American use case, it says we onboarded in 16 minutes on Monday. We're live in the platform on Wednesday, ran our first optimization on Thursday, and over the next week we had the highest website traffic that we've seen in a year. It's like real world, measurable, tangible shit that like you can tie onto. And that's why like we don't sign annual contracts. We'll say to everyone, hey dude, listen, we're gonna give you Three months, you can opt out after three months. You're going to have a Slack channel. We're going to meet you with you weekly, and we are going to do two things. Qualitatively, we're going to make you feel more confident in the top of funnel spend. Quantitatively, if this thing is not paying back for itself over, you know, multiple times over again, jump off the platform, right? That's the coolest part, especially when you're building a data company, is you're like, all right, now I have what I know I need to become a marketing company. Now 100%. it's like, how do I just make sure yep. every single person in the world knows we exist? <laughs> yeah, that's where he comes in. <laughs> yeah, but it's like you did, I mean, everyone will tell you a different part of it's the hard part, but I think you did the hard part where it's like you can prove statistical significance with yeah. real brands. To now right. it's just like, how do you get it out to the masses in a cost-effective way? One, dude, one, it's so great to see. Like, again, like in 80% of our business is coming from agencies. It's coming from my LinkedIn now. Like, I got hit up by a brand I've been trying to get into for months and their SVP of Omnichannel reached out to me and was like, dude, I'm seeing the stuff you're doing on LinkedIn. Let's go. Uh, and we're meeting next week. 
I, I just got one of those for the first time too. It's a great feeling, right? Big it's brands, like feeling. I've been following your content for a while. Like yeah. we're moving over to Shopify. We'd love to talk. It's, love that's, that. it's awesome. Yeah. It's, and that's real world tangible results, right? Yeah. And like people wouldn't be migrating their website, dude, doing millions of dollars. Like if you didn't have one, a compelling value prop, two, a simple product, and three, you know, actual results of what they can expect to, to benefit from. I love that note on your pricing strategy. I mean, that is like customer centric pricing 101. 100%. And I think a lot of founders go, we were talking about this before, like that midwit meme curve. Yeah. And early days of verbatim, when we started like two and a half years ago, I was just like, month to month, we got to prove it out every single month. And then over time, probably a year in, I'd talked to too many investors. Yeah. And I was like, six month annual <laughs> discounts. And now I'm just like, just. If it's working, let's keep going. Yeah. And then if it doesn't, we can pause, go allocate your money elsewhere. I, I love that. It's nice. You know? we're, we're the opposite, but that's because there's a lot of upfront work that goes into our process that it doesn't make financial sense for us to do hypothetically it. do all of that. That's and then fair. month three, you're like, you know what? Like, we're going to switch. It's like, it doesn't make sense. We're, we're rolling out our self-serve product the next couple of months. That'll be month to month, but the hero offering is yeah. annual. You have to do that, though. There's yeah. no way, other way because it's you have to mitigate and hedge the risk of like the upfront human capital that it takes to be deployed. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of the other MMM providers, there's a lot of humans that are involved, right? And that's why they're pushing at the minimum a six month contract, largely going to a year, because there's a lot of people that have to get integration set up and they have to train models and tweak models and customize models. Our value prop is why we can do this is in 16 minutes, you're going to click some buttons and the math is going to do the rest of yeah. the infrastructure. What is going to evolve now, like I was just meeting with a you know, a multi-billion dollar retailer this morning at the conference, and uh, like we can cover 80% of their integrations, but point and click, but there's channels out there that they're like, dude, we need to have this data in this model. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to have to start evolving our kind of like forward deploy engineer as you go up market to get some of these other data sets. And so it'll likely change our, the pricing structure will evolve. Smaller brands, boom, 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 click and go, but larger brands, you know, I think that's where... Um, Dude, I have a question. What did you do before Verbatim? I was in VC. You were in, v you were in venture before this? For like three years, straight out of college. Really? Yeah. I was a glorified BD associate. I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't some... Every young analyst out there you being honest yeah. about says it. they're an investor, and it's like, no, you're yeah. just running around trying to source deals, none of which will actually get done. Yeah. Um, but I was running a... Like every 22-year-old VC, I started an interview series and nice. a newsletter, because like that's what you're told to do. Yeah. And I got really good at cold emailing people. Really? And I, and I convinced uh, like hundreds of founders, a bunch of brands, but also like Mark Cuban, Rob Deerdeck, Tim Draper, Brad, like crazy names in both venture and consumer. And I was just doing little like health and wellness interviews with them. But every week for like <coughs> two years, I showed up on LinkedIn with my face next to like Mark Cuban's face and Rob Deerdeck's face. And so you can obviously see the analogy with like B2B case studies yeah, right there. Sure. But don't knock how like, they tell everyone to do that, but not everyone can Doesn't. do it. You know, you know, not <laughs> to cut funny. you off, but like you, Zara from Headline. Yeah, she oh, yeah. she's got like all the she's got like four newsletters. Yeah, 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 she's yeah. got like four Scoop. newsletters and all these crazy communities. And I'm like, that's a superpower. Oh, it is. It is. There's a lot of analysts who want to try to do that, but none can really get to that level. It is. It, the cons it, it's easy to start. Right. Consistency is really hard. But I did that for like two years. How then, wh wh how did you craft crack the cold? Question number one. How did you crack the cold email? Did you do different than two? Do you feel the cold email is still a viable a viable channel in B two B SaaS? I mean, it depends. I don't think it's viable in B two B SaaS. It depends on your contract size. Right. And so the same way, like we don't do SEO, but I'm a big fan of SEO. If your contract size isn't like 200k, right. if your contract size is 200k, people aren't starting their buying decision there. Right. Same thing, they're not going to start the buying decision on email. Gotcha. But if it, if you're like 50 bucks a month per consumer, right. that may work. Um, but basically, I kept doing that, and then all my founder friends that were like coming out of YC raised three or four million bucks. They were like this looks cool. We need to go to market content. Can you just like freelance for us? So I did, a, I worked with a couple and kept getting referrals. Right. And then at a certain point I was just like, Damn. we've like eight clients. Like, I, I, I need story, to start dude. this. Such a good and story. so that was like two and a half years ago. Yeah. And like year one and two was just like me and a handful of kids straight out of college who were like great writers, really yeah. good English programs. And then over the past year is when we started like landing kind of like fortune 500 logos. Yeah. And that's when we really brought in like a leadership team, like Claire, who, you yeah, know, is VP awesome. of ops. Cool. When, when Claire and Will go, yeah. Back to back to back to back. It's the funniest. <laughs> yeah. They're just extremely fast workers. Um, but past year, we really kind of like changed as yeah. a real business because we're like 24, 25 people now. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's cool to hear like, dude, you sit there at GoPuff and you get a bird's eye view of a problem that needs to be solved, right? And you see that, right? And then you're in VC. It's like, hey, go do this. And I did it really well and it turned into a business. And I think my story is those, you know, you burned out and want to try to 
build and sell something, right? And, and now we just sit on couches and talk shit on podcasts. Now we just sit on <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it goes. And throw golf it's a circle of life. It's you beautiful. Know? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not, not mad. But it's, it's, it's cool to hear, like, other people's story with that stuff. Like, it's, um, you just, you live and you learn and you make mistakes and you have ambitions and goals and some of them check out and some of them don't. But, like, my dad says it perfectly. He's like, you're like a, he's like, you're like a fucking Roomba. He's like, you just, <laughs> with, like, a little hole in a wall just he's like, keep going you just keep bouncing from wall to wall for a year I mean, dude I, I incorporated this in 2018 i quit in 2019 and we didn't start generating revenue true revenue until september of last year wow right it's a long time without it's revenue. a long time so, dude. so cool though. you put everything into four i'm a human 401k boom gone like yep. i dumped everything into it like yeah. it was a wild experience and it came down to like the the brink end and you know, it's like you hit that wall and you go into a new room and then you hit the next walls, but you, you have a car, right? In that car, you pick somebody up, right? You go into that next room and your car gets a little bigger, you pick somebody up, right? That needs to do this part of the, to keep the wheels moving. Some people get out of that car and then, you know, now you're kind of moving towards a big bus that has little departments within each bus, all driving towards that, you know, same direction in North Star. Yeah. Dude, this was awesome. It was fun. I had a lot it. of fun in this conversation. Yeah, it was great. Oh, yeah. Thank Appreciate you. you coming on. Talk to that camera and tell people where they can find you in Prussian. Yeah, so Michael True, T-R-U-E, like the opposite of false, um, on LinkedIn. Uh, prescient. We're going to be doing a new domain change because it's awful. It's prescient, P-R-E. S C I E N T dash A I dot I O. It bothered me when I first saw it. It, bo it bothers me too. Because I think we're going to do like a try prescient dot com mm. get prescient dot com yeah. something like that um yeah so don't judge them. keep an eye out for the new website if anybody plays <laughs> golf please reach out um anybody on shopify amazon retail absolute no-brainer to talk um but uh or just email me directly mike at prescient dash ai dot io and uh <laughs> maggie will shout out to maggie she'll uh my calendar sees her she'll she'll hook it up we'll get a time to speak oh yeah thank awesome. you man it's fun i appreciate you having come by